In the previous video, I argued that Jewish anti-missionaries often argue inconsistently, holding the New Testament to a level of skepticism to which they would never hold their own writings. At least the internet infidels do not have the same problem. They are willing to hold any religious text to the same level of scrutiny. Yet I still think that these skeptics are just as inconsistent, and deceptively so, as the anti-missionaries themselves. Skeptic John Loftus loves to bash Christian apologists for doing what he calls a retreat to the possible. Instead of offering an answer to the skeptic's objection, the apologist will instead insist that as long as the solution to a problem is possible, for example the problem of evil, then the objection fails. This complaint, I believe, is unwarranted. It confuses two types of possibility epistemic possibility, and metaphysical possibility. If something is epistemically possible, then for all we know it could be true. If something is metaphysically possible, then it's logically coherent and doesn't contradict a known necessary truth, regardless of whether it actually is true or not. If our retreat to the possible is a retreat to epistemic possibility, then I agree that this may very well be an argument from ignorance. If it is a retreat to metaphysical possibility, then the argument is not from ignorance, it's a demonstration that two concepts, for example God and evil, are not logically incompatible. However, many skeptics will give the same argument from ignorance, a retreat to the epistemically possible, of which they accuse Christian apologists. Just think with me a minute about some of the arguments for God. There's the Leibnizian cosmological argument, where everything needs an explanation for its existence, and demonstrates that God's existence is self-explanatory, while the physical world's existence is not. There's the Kalam argument, where the physical world's origin entails its cause. There is the teleological argument where the fine-tuning of the constants and quantities at the beginning of the universe point to design. There are moral, aesthetic, and is-ought arguments which demonstrate that certain values that we all believe in and have to believe in in order to live out our lives are both mind-dependent and objective. Hence, only an eternal and perfect mind can explain them. There are entire families of epistemic arguments which show that our beliefs in inductive reasoning, the reliability of our mental faculties, and the reliability of our sense perception are unjustified without God. Finally, there is the ontological argument, of which I have made two videos, which shows that our modal intuitions entail the existence of God. The responses from skeptics are numerous. They object to the fact that the second law of thermodynamics gives us a finite past by arguing that someone might hypothetically be able to construct a perpetual motion machine based on Brownian motion. They object to the expansion of the universe entailing its beginning by appealing to wildly speculative scenarios based on certain variations of string theory. They argue that teleological arguments are invalid because you can't calculate the probability of an event after it has occurred. Let's hope they never go into the gambling enforcement industry. They argue that moral values are either not mind-dependent, after all, or that they are not objective. All of these objections seem to be pretty desperate and implausible. The question is, how do we show these abs the absurdity of these objections? I think the solution is simple. Ask the skeptic whether he or she would accept the same line of reasoning for young earth creationism. This is not to knock young earth creationism, although I myself am an old earth creationist, but to use young earth creationism as an example. Because if there is one thing that atheists and other non-profits hate, it is young earth creationism. If the skeptic says that the physical world came into existence uncaused and not out of anything, and just happened to have all the fine-tuning of values such as the expansion of the universe, argue that perhaps the world came into existence 6,000 years ago uncaused out of nothing. Or perhaps our solar system came into existence 6,000 years ago as a result of a random collision of particles. The probability that our solar system formed this way is not zero. If the atheist objects and says the universe or the world looks older, Tell them that all possible configurations, including one with the appearance of age, are equally unlikely, the way that any given hand in poker is equally unlikely to be dealt. Besides, you cannot calculate the probability of an event after it has occurred, right? Some skeptics in response to the scientific evidence for the beginning of the universe will say that it's possible that we may one day come up with a new model that proves the eternality of the universe. Fine. Well, science is always changing. It's also possible that scientists may one day come up with a discovery that proves the universe is 6,000 years old and that all species were created in their current form. If they object to the existence of objective moral values, saying that they are mere instincts, tell them you intend to convince your family and friends of young earth creationism by any means necessary. Who cares if you intend to be less than honest in giving all the facts? Our ideas of morality are just evolved instincts anyway, right? So it's not like they're obligatory or anything, so why not violate them? One skeptic objected to the ontological argument by stating that I have not proven beyond a doubt that my premises are true. He argued that the premises need to be known with certainty in order for the ontological argument 
argument to be a sound argument. This is a terrible misunderstanding of the nature of arguments. In a valid deductive argument, it is impossible for the premises to be true when the conclusion falls. Therefore, it is irrational to believe the premises and deny the conclusion. You do not need to be certain of the premises in order for the argument to be sound. If certainty was the criterion for a good argument, there would be almost no good arguments. Instead, the premises of the argument merely need to be more plausible than their negations. As long as you believe the premises of a valid deductive argument, you cannot rationally deny the conclusion. Always ask yourself, whenever you face a skeptic's objection, what if it was the other way around? Would they tolerate this kind of reasoning if it was used against them? If not, then their objection is untenable, as inconsistency is a sure sign of a failed argument. Shalom Aleichem.